Welcome to another episode of the My Mysterious Bible Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Norton, and today we will delve into one of the most unsettling events described in the book of Exodus. Or it would be if you don't like insects. The fourth plague, flies. Let's explore the narrative, the cultural implications, and the divine message embedded in this dramatic episode from the Bible. And we're going to, going to begin with the text. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me, or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day... I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by swarms of flies. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It would not be right to do so, for the offering we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. So Pharaoh, so Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again by not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also, and he did not let the people go. And I was reading from the ESV, by the way, and that's Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32. Now we're going to turn to the IVP Bible Background Commentary of the Old Testament. Chapter 8, verses 20 through 32, The land is ruined by flies. The insect featured in the fourth plague is not named. Instead, the text speaks of swarms, using a word known only in relation to this context. Flies are a logical choice, both because of the climate and the conditions that exist with the rotting fish and frogs and decaying vegetations from the previous plagues. Because it is a carrier of skin anthrax associated with the latter plagues, the species Somoxus calcitrans has been the most popular identification for this plague. As both pests and carriers, these insects brought ruination on the land. Verse 22, Goshen. This is the first plague that does not afflict the Israelites living in Goshen. The precise location of Goshen is still unknown though it is certainly in the eastern part of the Delta region of the Nile. 8.26. A sacrifice detestable to the Egyptians. When Pharaoh offers to let them make their sacrifices in the land, Moses does not claim the need to conduct the rituals at a holy site, but objects that their rituals are unacceptable because they sacrifice that which is detestable to the Egyptians. Slaughter of animals to provide food for gods was prevalent in the Egyptian religious practice, as many reliefs portray. But blood sacrifices of animals played little role in the sun worship, the king worship, or the funeral observances that constituted much of the Egyptian religion. Often the animal being slaughtered was considered to represent an enemy of the god. Now we're going to turn to a different commentary. A commentary critical, experimental, and practical on the Old and New Testaments. And I'm in Volume 1, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And going back to the fly situation. 
Rise up early, Pharaoh, lo, he cometh, and Pharaoh still appearing stubborn. Moses was ordered to meet him while walking on the banks of the Nile, and repeat his request for the liberation of Israel, threatening in case of continued refusal to cover every house, from the palace to every lowly cottage, with swarms of flies. At the same time, as a proof of the power that accomplished this judgment, the land of Goshen should be exempted from the calamity. The appeal was equally vain as before, and the predicted evil overtook the country in the form of what was not literally flies, such as we are accustomed to, but as the original word signifies, a mingling, a diverse sort of flies, and this commentary references Psalm 78.45, and then it lists out the gadfly, the dogfly, the cockroach, the Egyptian beetle, for all these are mentioned by different writers. Flies succeeded gnats in the ordinary seasons and in consequence of dampness of the air for a considerable portion of the years. Flies, fleas, and bugs are plentiful. They are also very destructive, some of them inflicting severe bites on animals, others destroying clothes, books, plants, or pretty much everything you can imagine. The worship of flies, particularly of the beetle, was a prominent part of the religion of the ancient Egyptians. Moreover, the tutelary deity of Lower Egypt was worshipped under the symbol of a winged asp. And this comes from Wilkins' Ancient Egypt, Volume 5, pages 45 and 85. The employment of these winged deities to chastise them must have been painful and humiliating to the Egyptians, while it must at the same time have strengthened the faith of the Israelites in the God of their fathers as the only object, object of worship. Thou mayest know that I am the Lord amid the earth, rather the soul, the sovereign proprietor and controller of Egypt, as well as all the earth. I will put a division between my people and thy people. The reason for this distinction is to be traced to the circumstance of the magicians acknowledging the power of some, perhaps Egyptian deity in the former plague, but ignoring Jehovah. So basically, they're uh, attributing the plagues to their own gods and not to the God of the Bible, the one true God, the God of Israel. And the marvelous exemption of that people from a scourge which afflicted other parts of the land was meant to arrest their attention to the true author of the plague. Now let's go on. The land was corrupted or laid waste for this prodigious swarm of flies not only afflicted the people by their sharp and inflammatory stings, but by the deposit of innumerable ova which went on to devour the land. And it references Psalm 78, 45. So basically, these swarms didn't procreate it and left behind a uh, pretty bad insect-fested environment for them. Going on, 25 through 32, Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land, between impatient anxiety to be freed of this scourge and a reluctance to part with the Hebrew bondsmen, the king followed the course of expediency. He proposed to let them free to engage in their religious rites within any part of his kingdom. But true to his instructions, Moses would accede to no such arrangement. He stated the most valid reason to show the danger of it. We shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes. The meaning is not that the animals offered and sacrificed by the Israelites being held sacred by the Egyptians would naturally give offense to the latter, but it was the disregard for certain preparatory and accompanying rites such as the way they would examine their bull or ox before, before sacrificing. And basically, they're not going to go by the standards that the Egyptians have for sacrificing an animal. So, and there's, they were very meticulous about checking its tongue, checking its underbelly, checking every part of an ox or a bull before sacrificing it. Otherwise, it would be an offense to their gods. Israelites are not going to be able to keep that standard. They're going to sacrifice lambs and, and goats, and 
they're not going to be, be able to be as picky as the Egyptians would demand. The certainty of rousing the fierce fanaticism of the Egyptians by their inattention to these superstitious minutia was assigned by Moses as a prudential reason for refusing to comply with the king's offer to let the Israelites hold their festival within his kingdom. And this reason was rendered irresistible by a renewed mention of the divine command to go out into the desert. The king, having yielded so far as to allow them a brief holiday across the border annexed to this concession a request that Moses would entreat with Jehovah for the removal of the plague. Moses promised to do so, and it was removed the following day. In the Septuagint, the insect that plagued the Egyptians was called the dogfly, and this circumstance is deserving of some consideration. As the translators of that version were in the very country in which the scene of the judgment is set. Moreover, the Egyptians held the dog in the greatest veneration, worshipping the animal under the name Anubis, and consequently the punishment of the dogfly must have felt by that people to be particularly severe. The dogfly is now unknown. It may not be uninteresting to subjoin a new and ingenious conjecture that has been thrown out by an eminent entomologist on this subject. It has been suggested to me, says Dr. Kirby, in the Bridgewater Treatise, page 357, that the Egyptian plague of the flies was a cockroach. And they state biological terminology for it. A very voracious insect which not only bites animals, but may tender herbs and fruits, you know, inedible. The Hebrew name of the animal by, animal by which a slight change of pronunciation is the same by which the raven is distinguished, furnishes no slight argument for, in favor of it. The same word also, by a similar alteration of point, signifies the evening. Now the cockroach at this time is black, with the interior margin of the thorax being white and it never emerges from its hiding place until the evening, both of which circumstances would furnish a reason for the name given to it, and it might be called the evening insect, both from its color and from the time of its appearance. But no sooner was the pressure over than the spirit of fear of Pharaoh, like a bent bow, springing back to its normal state, and regardless of his promise, he refused to let the people depart. So let's go over some of the key takeaways we've covered from these two commentaries. Number one, the insect featured in the fourth plague is not named. Instead, the texts speak of swarms, using a word known only in relation to this context. Flies are logical for both the climate and the conditions that exist with the rotting fish and frogs and decaying vegetation from the previous plagues. Because it is a carrier of skin anthrax associated with the latter plagues, the species Stomoxis calcitrans has been a very popular identification for the insect. Number two, this is the first plague that does not afflict the Israelites living in Goshen. Number three, the sacrifice was detestable to the Egyptians. The Hebrew god, the animal being slaughtered, was being sacrificed to would very likely be considered an enemy of their sun god. This would have been a bane to the Egyptians and could very likely have provoked the Egyptians to violence against the, the Israelites. Number four, the original word signify for the insect signifies a mingling of diverse sorts of flies. The gadfly, dogfly, cockroach, Egyptian beetle, as these are all mentioned by different writers of commentary on the subject. Number five, no sooner than the pressure over was relieved that the plague is lifted, the spirit of Pharaoh, like a bent bow, sprung back to its normal state. Regardless of his promise, Pharaoh refused to let the people depart. It seems foolish to me, but I guess Pharaoh is still holding on hope to his pantheon of gods and him supposed to be a incarnation of the sun god Ra himself, I guess he still believes that he can play games with the god of Israel and with the servant of the god of Israel, Moses. And he will take it to and escalate it to a horrible level, as we will see in the future. I hope that gave a little bit of uh, insight and context 
to this particular plague, and we shall move on to the next one. See you next time.